Welcome to the Boxing Gossip channel, please hit subscribe if you are new. I'm back with another Patreon request and it's another one from my man Faraz. Um, thank you to him for his continued support of the channel and for his continued requests via Patreon. For those who are interested, uh, link to my Patreon page in the description box below. Um, now regular viewers will know that Faraz has done a number of requests. We've been working on one a month and they've been on Mike Tyson. So I think the first one we did was Mike Tyson versus the modern day elite at heavyweight. We then did Tyson Holyfield, we then did Tyson Douglas, and it's really sort of exploring the fancy matchup theme. How would Mike Tyson do against different fighters of different eras? We've got a few more videos planned to do in due course as well, continuing on a monthly basis. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's been interesting and I've actually enjoyed doing these requests and I'll tell you why. Um, firstly, I've been running this YouTube channel now since late 2013. It's been good um, to do something so different. It's been good to mix it up. I've also found it quite enjoyable to have the reason to go back over some old fights. You know, sometimes in boxing, uh, there's so many breaking news stories, there's so many current fights, it's kind of hard to break out of that cycle. But, you know, throughout the course of doing these requests, I've been watching a lot of Mike. I've been watching Bo Holyfield. Um, and we're going to be what, talking about some other different types of fighters as well. And for me, it's been quite eye-opening. But this particular video is going to be discussing Mike Tyson against Riddick Bo. And um, how Tyson would have fared if that particular matchup um, was ever made when both guys were at their... Um, peaks. Um, now, obviously, that was a fight that didn't happen. You know, in some of the previous requests, Tyson versus Holyfield, Tyson versus Douglas, fights have occurred, but they have maybe not occurred at a time when Tyson or the other fighter was at their peaks. So this one's a little bit different, um, as you know, obviously, Tyson and Bo never fought, let alone never fought at their peak, they just never fought full stop. Before I get into the commentary on this, let me start by saying, the thing that I've learned most as I've done this series of videos is, we often talk about how much hype there is about boxers currently. Um, we often talk about how much hype there is around the current generation. So, the amount of times I've heard Joshua described as a Hearn hype job, or Wilder saying, oh he's all hype, you know, he doesn't have too many skills. At the minute, Daniel Dubois is kind of known as a guy who there's a huge amount of hype around. And I think boxing fans sometimes believe that hyping fighters and the hype surrounding a fighter is, is a bit of a new um, a new thing. You know, as I've done these videos, I've learned that hype around fighters is something that there's always been, uh, even before I was born. And, you know, some of these fighters, the likes of Mike Tyson, were hyped to the next level potentially hyped even more so than you know the fighters of today i've also found you know i was kind of brought up around boxing i was kind of brought up with the viewpoint that you know mike tyson maybe didn't achieve as much as the other heavyweights but in terms of when he was at his best he was probably the most deadly most unbeatable heavyweight out there and what i've learned over the course of doing these videos and other sort of research into boxing that i've done over the years is that the vast majority of fighters are very, very beatable. And it's impossible to simply say, you know, there is one fighter who is easily able to walk through all, all other fighters. Um, so to give an example, you know, when I do a video on Mike Tyson, nearly every time I get 10 comments saying, nobody could have lived with a peak Iron Mike, or peak Mike Tyson walks through this person in 30 seconds. And you get all of these comments and I think boxing fans are like that in the sense that they like to trash the current day heavyweights oh Joshua's got no stamina oh Wilder's got no technique oh Parker hasn't been in with anyone you know they like to trash the current heavyweights but then there's this kind of almost religious um reverence paid to fighters of days gone by oh you know how dare you question George Foreman's chin? How dare you question Joe Fraser's power? You know, these are the, the greatest fighters in the sports history. Well, what I've learned is that all fighters are beatable. You know, people will say, how could Tyson Fury beat George Foreman? Tyson Fury was knocked over by Steve Cunningham. 
I actually saw something that Hatman had posted um, recently uh, on a related note, and I, I actually agree with him on this. You know, you look at Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson was beaten, and in fact, he was beaten closer to his peak than people think, and he had very, very, very tough fights at his peak, you know. Uh, people say Tyson at his peak would have walked through any man in one round. Well, he fought Tillis at his peak. He fought Mitch Green at his peak. And he got taken the distance by both of those guys. And a lot of people think that Tillis beat him. Tillis certainly took multiple rounds of Tyson and drew him very close as a minimum. Let's put it that way. You know, people say Lennox Lewis is, you know, an all-time great. And he is. He is. But let's have it right. Lennox Lewis knocked unconscious by Hassim Rackman. Lennox Lewis knocked unconscious by Oliver McCall. You know, does this mean Lennox Lewis isn't an all-time great? Absolutely not. But it shows that even these guys who are the renowned all-time great fighters, the guys who make most people's top five lists, top ten lists, even these guys were fallible. Even these guys were beatable. Even these guys had off days or times where they, you know, look very, very beatable. So I don't think it's fair to say, oh, Joshua got dropped by Klitschko, therefore he couldn't beat Joe Fraser. Or, you know, oh, Deontay Wilder got dropped by a journeyman um, when he was new in the pro ranks. How could you compare him to a guy like Larry Holmes? You know, the truth is that most fighters in history you can pick holes in. Even Muhammad Ali, widely regarded as the greatest heavyweight of all time. Yeah, didn't Muhammad Ali have difficult nights? Didn't Muhammad Ali have times where he lost fights? Didn't have Muhammad Ali have times where he, uh, you know, hit a canvas? And these were against guys, you know, he, he was knocked over by guys who were not considered elite level heavyweights at the time um, and history doesn't remember them as elite level heavyweights now does that mean Muhammad Ali is not the greatest all-time heavyweight absolutely not that is not the point that I'm trying to make my point is that I think boxing fans are kind of very very guilty of writing off the current crop of heavyweights as hype jobs and really promoting historic heavyweight figures in their minds and almost making it an outrageous thing to do to raise the question who would win in a fight between Wilder and Holyfield you know um, you know if if Hassim Rackman beat Lennox Lewis then it is conceivable that Deontay Wilder could beat Lennox Lewis does that mean I'd make Deontay Wilder a favourite? no does that mean Deontay Wilder's resume and legacy is as good as Lennox Lewis? no but it's at least a question it's not something that should be written off because Lennox Lewis did lose to uh, Hassim Rackman. Mike Tyson did lose to Buster Douglas. You know, Mike Tyson losing to Buster Douglas, known as one of the biggest upsets in the history of the sport. Do you honestly think if Mike Tyson fought Anthony Joshua, you'd be able to get the same odds on Anthony Joshua? 42 to 1, I believe it was, as you were able to get on Buster Douglas that night. Of course not. Of course not. You know... Um, so I'm sure when I do this video now on Mike Tyson versus Riddick Bowe, I will get the usual selection of comments uh, advising me that Mike Tyson would end Riddick Bowe in 30 seconds, and anyone who questions otherwise is an absolute idiot. Um, but for me, there's much more of an open conversation here, and the more I've looked into Mike Tyson and the more I've looked into more historic elite level boxing figures, the more I've realised that the vast majority are beatable and the vast majority had weaknesses that could be exploited and very often were exploited. Um, you know, and Mike Tyson for me is the prime example of this. Mike Tyson for me, a guy who was the ultimate on top fighter. If Mike Tyson could get you where he wanted you in the ring, if he could implement his, his style, he was a devastating force. But if Mike Tyson didn't get his own way in the ring, if the fight was fought at the opponent's pace, at the opponent's distance, to the opponent's style, he became a guy who was imminently beatable. Imminently beatable. Um, so let's, let's talk through that. Um, in the past, we have seen, as I've already referred to in this video, the Tillis fight, where Tillis danced, used reins, used distance, used movement, um, and befuddled Mike Tyson. And as I say, in a 10 round fight, stole four or five rounds of him. We also saw the Amanda Holyfield fight, 
uh, where Holyfield brought the fight to Mike Tyson. He refused to be bullied and intimidated by Mike Tyson and ran straight into the eye of the storm. Took the fight on the inside with Tyson, traded with Tyson up close, took some of Tyson's best work and then reverted with his own. We saw the, the Buster Douglas fight and I kind of referred to Buster Douglas and the approach that he took as in between the two. You know, he had some of the movement and some of the long range work of Attilis, but he also had some of that attitude of a holy field of refusing to be intimidated, refusing to bow down and, you know, having that fight up close. I actually view Riddick Bowe as comparable in many ways to, uh, to Buster Douglas. You know, I think Riddick Bowe, um, is a guy who would have the potential to cause uh, Mike Tyson problems. Let's actually, well, let's, let's pause where I'm at for a second. So I was about to start talking about Riddick Bowe's style and how I think that would um, compare with Mike Tyson's. Perhaps I'm getting a little bit of ahead of myself here. Uh, these videos always turn into 20, 30, 40 minute rants and I sense this is gonna be another one um, because I've done 10 minutes there on an intro. Um, Riddick Bowe for me, a fighter I like, a fighter I've always enjoyed watching and a fighter who I've enjoyed watching all the more in the last three months. Um, one of the forgotten men in terms of all-time great lists. You know, you see all the time people doing their all-time top 10 heavyweights. Riddick Bowe, for me, um, often excluded from those lists and potentially, unfortunately. Olympic silver medalist, 44 fights as a professional. 43 wins, one loss. The only loss came against all-time great Evander Holyfield. It was a majority decision loss. And this is a guy who Riddick Bowe beat twice. So 43 and one, the one loss was a majority decision loss that he beat the person who beat him twice. You know, that is some formidable numbers, especially when you consider that some of the names he was in with, the likes of Evander Holyfield, are also thought of in very, very high esteem. Um, I've done a bit of research on Riddick Bowe. Um, the seeming consensus was that he was an inconsistent guy, struggled with discipline, struggled with drive, struggled with his weight. Um, I saw an interview with his manager, Rock Newman, there was reference to him being barred from the kitchen during training. There was reference to him being an awful in the gym, awful training. He just didn't have the work right. I saw an interview on the subject with Lou Duva, who actually came out and said that Riddick Bowe never showed the drive to be a champion and made reference to the fact that Tyrell Biggs was able to smash him up in sparring as Bowe was simply going through the motions. You know, Bowe... My recollection, you know, or not recollection, that's the wrong word because I was too young at the time. But looking back at Riddick Bowe, having done this research, I get the impression a lazy guy who allowed his career to spiral out of control from time to time and probably didn't hit the consistent high peaks he should have done as a result. Having said that, a massively, massively, massively talented individual um, with a huge amount of attributes. Um... He had skill in, you know, skill. He had um, heart, as was shown in the Holyfield fight, etc. His manager, Rock Newman, said that the Holyfield one fight was by far Riddick Bowe's best camp. And, you know, the results of the that camp were kind of evident in that first fight. Anyone who's seen Bowe Holyfield one knows what a classic it is and knows on his day what a formidable fighter. Riddick Bowe would be, um, you know, and anyone who doubts Riddick Bowe should watch that fight and to see what he has to offer at his best, because, you know, that Riddick Bowe is a very, very, very good fighter. There was then the famous world tour that Rock Newman took Bowe on after that, and a lot of, you know, people who look at Bowe's downfall kind of blame that world tour for having uh, a bit of an effect, and Riddick Bowe becoming a celebrity, becoming overweight, touring the world, meeting famous people, and not spending his time in, in the gym. Um, so there you go. As for the Tyson thing, they went to the same school, they were brought up in the same neighborhood, they were friends. I saw an interview with Mike Tyson where he claimed he loved Riddick Bowe, he loved him to death, and he couldn't fight him. Um, the timing was also difficult. Um, 
you know, when, when Tyson um, got out of prison in 1995, it took him about a year or so before he started fighting serious contenders, mid-late 1996. By that time, Riddick Bowe potentially already faded, you know, potentially not really at the same peaks he was a few years earlier. Um, so I guess you could you could argue that timing was a big reason behind the fact that they didn't fight combined with their relationship. I guess Tyson getting upset by Buster Douglas um, earlier on in his career was another major contributing factor. Um, but there you go, there you go. Um, I saw interviews with Riddick Bow where he kind of claimed that Tyson knew him very well and knew what he had brought to the table um, and was kind of not really running towards that fight because he knew what a threat that Riddick Bow was. You know, maybe that's true, maybe it's not true. This was a much older Riddick Bow, and unfortunately, old Riddick Bow's life as it currently stands uh, is a bit of a uh, you know he, he's he's having very very difficult times outside of the ring let's put it that way so you know whether he actually believes that Tyson ran scared of him or not I, I, I don't know um, but certainly the fight didn't happen timing a friendship a closeness between the two guys all sorts of um, reasons contributing to that anyway I've rambled for 16 minutes without addressing the actual question that Faraz has asked me which is who would win in a fight if the two guys fought so let me do that now um, Pete Tyson will refer to as the sort of 1987-1988 Tyson that was unifying belts. Pete Bow, let's talk about the Bow from Holyfield One. You know that was what his own manager Rock Newman described as the best of Riddick Bow, and you know I can certainly think there's some merit in that having watched that fight. So let's talk about how those two guys um, would have done if they squared off against each other. I think Riddick Bow has a lot of tools to cause Mike Tyson a hell of a lot of problems. Clearly, he's a substantially bigger man than Mike Tyson. Substantially bigger man. Could he have used range? Could he have used boxing skill from distance in the same way that Buster Douglas did? In the same way that James Tillis did to cause Tyson problems? Riddick Bow was also someone who could be involved in a war. You know, people question Riddick Bow's heart, but when it actually got called out in that Holyfield fight, he stood there, he traded with uh, Holyfield, he went to war, and he emerged victorious. So, when I look at Riddick Bowe, I wonder if he could have had similar success to Buster Douglas. Was Riddick Bowe similar in certain ways to Douglas, although potentially at a higher level in my opinion? Was Riddick Bowe that rare fighter who could cause Tyson problems from the outside, and then when Tyson did close the gap, could Bo live with him? Could Bo trade with him? Could Bo use his size and that sort of inside ability to go to war that he sowed in the Holyfield fight to cause Tyson real, real problems? Now, you're going to get the Tyson fanboys who will insist the fight would have lasted 30 seconds. Um, but Riddick Bo retired with a record of 43-1 and one without ever being knocked out. I can't sit here and tell you Riddick Bo's got the best chin since George Foreman. Um, but let's make it very, very clear that Riddick Bowe was a formidable, formidable guy in there. Um, and I think he would have had the potential to cause Tyson real problems. Because I think Tyson would have struggled with Bowe's skill and size from distance. And from my reading of Mike Tyson, when he is able to get the fight into a brawl, he likes to be able to dominate, to dictate, to bully. And it becomes relatively easy for Mike Tyson's not relatively easy it becomes possible to break Mike Tyson's will um, when he can't dominate in the way he's used to you know examples of that um, the Holyfield fight the Buster Douglas fight where it seems that Tyson simply just cannot nudge himself ahead when he needs to so for me if I was talking about potential styles to beat Mike Tyson, I would actually say that Riddick Bowe is almost one of the ideal guys in terms of attributes to cause Mike Tyson problems. The combination of long range boxing work, catching a smaller man as he was coming in, frustrating him, utilizing a jab, 
combined with the kind of guy who can stand up to Mike and trade with him on the inside and has shown in the Holyfield fight that he can go to the trenches. Was Riddick Bowe's downfall that he too often got sucked into these scraps? I think there's some merit in that, having watched a lot of Bo. You know, Bo was one of these guys who could have maybe made fights a little bit easier than he did. He was someone who did have that skill and that range, and he could have fought many, many more fights from distance than he actually tended to throughout his career. And that could be a problem against Mike Tyson. You know, for a guy like Riddick Bo, it's great that he's able to stand and trade if he needs to, but you do want to see him pumping that jab, using the diff distance, creating reins, and trying to keep the smaller man at bay. If Tyson tried to stick it on Bo, and Bo ended up getting sucked into a scrap in the first minute of the first round, I do think that's a negative for Bo. You want Bo to be able to stand and trade when he wants to and when he needs to, but you don't want him getting sucked into that war straight away and totally negating his sort of boxing skills and his range throughout the course of the fight. Um, question marks over Bo's chin. I think it's very hard to judge Bo's chin because, um, you know, he didn't fight Lewis who was a big puncher. He didn't fight Tyson, who were a big puncher. And I guess those guys go down as the two biggest, hardest hitting heavyweights of the era that Bo campaigned in. Um, Holyfield, who he fought three times. You know, Holyfield could punch. He probably wasn't a one-punch knockout artist in the same ilk as a Tyson and, uh, you know, of a Lewis. Uh, and Holyfield did wobble Bo during their fights without stopping but obviously um but what i would say is the nature of that fight that Bo fought against holyfield the nature of those fights were so brutal um that you know i i find it hard to say that Bo being wobbled is a sign of a bad chin i've always had the attitude on this channel that if you get wobbled if you get hurt if you get rocked and it doesn't stop you from fighting on. It doesn't stop you from winning. That's actually a sign of a good chin, not a bad chin. Um, you know, so I'm going to say that Bo has given me no massive cause to suspect his chin is dodgy. However, he's also given me no massive proof to suggest that his chin is world class. And, you know, going up against a guy like Mike Tyson, you're going to need to have a world class chin in order to get by. Um, So it's tough. It's really tough in terms of making a decision as to who would win this fight if they did fight. Um, I think it is very much a possibility that Bo could have beaten Tyson. I do. And I appreciate that we'll have people in all sorts of fury and rage as they're watching this video. But to those people... I say to you that if Buster Douglas can beat Mike Tyson, uh, and this is a Tyson who was still a, a younger man at the time. I'm not saying he was at his peak, but he was still a younger man. If Tillis can go the distance when Tyson was at his peak, then we shouldn't raise it as out of the question that Bo can be successful. I believe that Bo was potentially a superior talent to the whole list of people who actually did beat Mike Tyson with the exception of Lennox Lewis. You know, Lennox Lewis, I think he's up there in the penthouse of the elite, if you like. But putting Lennox Lewis to one side, looking at the guys who had success and actually beat Tyson, I think Bo could rank every bit as high as those guys, if not higher. Um, so I don't think it's out of the question whatsoever. I do think that Bo would likely get sucked into a scrap if he fought Mike Tyson. And I do think that the fight would probably descend into a fight in Tyson's favour uh, if the two guys did fall. And when I say in his favour, I mean stylistically. Um, obviously, it's hard because we don't have the evidence of actual footage of the two guys within the ring. But watching Tyson as I do and watching... Bo as I have done, I think quite instantly Tyson would be looking to close down the gap, Bo would probably be looking to keep distance, I think Tyson would probably catch Bo and then I think all hell would break loose and we'd have a, 
um, ho uh, we'd have a Bow Holyfield one situation in the ring again. And I think once we got there, it's unlikely it would ever return to a sort of cat and mouse boxer versus brawler style fight after that. Um, I see it as a 50-50. I see it as a 50-50. If I had a gun to my head, to use that phrase, and I had to pick one of them, by the narrowest of margins, I'd probably go for Mike Tyson. Just on the basis that I think a real peak Mike Tyson would have probably tested Bo in terms of Bo's chin. And I think the speed, the ferocity, the explosiveness of a Pete Tyson would probably be more of a test than anything Riddick Bo actually faced in his professional career. So, based on that, if I had a gun to my head, in what I would see view as a 50-50 coin flip type of fight, I would probably side with Mike Tyson. But what I will say is this is probably one of my least confident predictions in one of these fancy matchups. I could see Riddick Bowe bringing out a different level to his game. I mean, let's remember, in this video we are talking a prime Mike Tyson versus a prime Riddick Bowe. Whilst Riddick Bowe was very, very, very inconsistent and let himself down at times in his career, a prime Riddick Bowe was the guy who fought Evander Holyfield in the first fight. And that was a guy who brought levels to the ring that nobody expected at the time. And that was a guy who showed heart and durability and will to win that people had said it would be unlikely he would do. So that Riddick Bowe, that much bigger, longer than Mike Tyson, a guy who probably would have a boxing advantage from the outside, and a guy who showed that he could serve it up to an all-time top 10 great in Evander Holyfield, maybe land the bigger, better shots on the inside. You know, that Riddick Bow beating a peak Mike Tyson, certainly not out of the question. I think there's strong scope that he could have had every bit of success that James Buster Douglas did. And I think there's strong scope that Riddick Bowe was actually a more talented, more complete specimen than Buster Douglas. I view it as a very, very tough fight to call. I'm totally on the line. But if I have to get off the fence, if I have to make a decision, I'd say that despite Riddick Bowe's 44-fight professional career, he probably didn't face anyone with the speed, the explosiveness and the power of Mike Tyson. I think that he probably would have got sucked into that war that would have played into Tyson's hands. And I'm just less certain that he would have been able to take that power over the course of an extended fight. It's not a confident pick. I could see both guys winning. But Tyson to find the punch, the KO Riddick bow, mid rounds would be my prediction. Let me know your take on this video. Let me know your take on the comments I've made. Who would you pick to win this matchup? Also, let me know about Riddick Bo. If you're the kind of person who has a top 10 all-time great heavy list, or a top 20 all-time great heavyweight list, does Riddick Bo fit into that list? Is he a case of someone who was a talent, but someone who didn't quite do enough in terms of you know the fact that he didn't fight Lennox Lewis. He didn't fight Mike Tyson. You know, he didn't fight some of the biggest names of his era. Let me know your take. Leave your comments in the section below. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the thumbs up. If you're new, if you haven't already done so for whatever reason, please hit subscribe. As always, appreciate you guys tuning into my channel. Thanks for watching.